This session is um, going to be leveraging ASVS into your secure SDLC. Uh, our speaker has uh, quite an extensive background in a number of different um, facets of security. He's uh, been a practitioner. He's uh, currently in a management position with Cerner where his team um, has looked at more of the operational sides. He's worked on a lot of interesting projects that uh, I'll let him uh, speak to as, uh, as time warrants. Um, but I'd like everybody to give a warm welcome to Derek Fisher. All right, thank you everybody for, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. All right, so thank everybody for coming. I know it's after lunch, so I'll try to keep this you know, engaging. Hopefully nobody falls asleep. Um, so just to get into it, I'm not the famous basketball player, Derek Fisher. I actually got that today um, in the hallway um, or at one of the uh, vendors' uh, tables uh, earlier. Um, but I am not him. I will sign autographs, though, if you want to. Um, I have been in engineering. <clears throat> I actually used to play basketball. I was pretty good, um, but I was not that good. Um, I've been in engineering for about 20 years now. I started out in hardware engineering. I did a lot of mechanical and electrical uh, design work, drafting. Uh, after about 10 years or so of that, I switched over, went to school for software uh, engineering. Um, got into software engineering uh, quite a while ago, um, and then took my uh, graduate degree um, in computer security uh, about five, six years ago, uh, and have been in security for about six, seven years. Um, Primarily focused in application security, uh, but a lot of the stuff that I've done uh, has spanned uh, a lot of different uh, aspects of um, security, not just with application security, but also in the operational side, uh, scanning, um, threat modeling, things like that. So um, I am uh, from Cerner Corporation. If anybody, does anybody here know who Cerner, Cerner is? Okay, so we're a healthcare company. We're the largest one in America today. Um, my team's primary focus, and one of my team members is sitting up front, um, our, our team has been primarily focused in uh, driving requirements into uh, security. Um, as I mentioned, we do a lot of threat modeling and other things as well. But our, our primary uh, focus recently has been with you know, security requirements. So um, out of that project that we've been working on, uh, I just wanted to share with everybody here what we've kind of learned um, by leveraging the ASVS in our software development lifecycle. I don't need to go into depth here, that's the reason why we're all here, right? Security is important. That's why we all have jobs um, in this field. That's why we're all here to learn something new about security um, or see things that we know that, you know that we already know some stuff about, but we want to learn more about. Um, it needs to be an inter you know, a, a, a big part of what we do daily. Um, part of why we wanted to look into uh, doing the security requirements in Cerner is that it kind of takes security out of the realm of specialists, you know, the people that go and get their security degrees or go and spend a lot of time in security, putting require, you know, security requirements in the development life cycle really kind of makes security more part of everybody, you know, all the developers' life. It's not just, it's no longer black magic to, to everybody. So one of the, uh, for us particularly with uh, Cerner um, is that, you know, health records are very, right now they're, they're very lucrative on the black market, um, more lucrative than a credit card number. Primary reason is that when target breach happened, my credit card, my wife's credit card, you know, all, our credit cards were, were compromised. We just called the, um, the bank and said we need a new credit card. That's not a problem, right? They, they just issue a new one, cancel the old one. If you get a HIV positive result, you get a cancer diagnosis, you can't call a doctor and get that changed, right? So these are, these are valuable uh, records and information, um, and not just with the health information, but also with some financial data that's associated with your health record or even just personal information, your street address, your phone number, things like this, are all part of, you know, from our perspective in Cerner, that's all part of what we're trying to defend. Again, I think we've all seen uh, similar concepts here. Solving defects early in the, in the life cycle is far cheaper than solving them later on down the road. Um, this one, again, we've all seen variations of this. This one came from uh, 2015. Um, showing that it, you know a, a, or a, a bug or a vulnerability found you know early on it's ten dollars you know to fix it or I'm sorry hundred dollars to fix it as opposed to finding it in production when it's ten thousand dollars. So I took a quick you know 
Google search um, to find, you know, to get the, the named vulnerabilities that were found in 2016. Uh, there's kind of like a running joke in security, I'm sure some of you have heard that, is that it's not really truly a vulnerability unless it gets a, you know, an icon, a name, possibly theme music, maybe t-shirts. Um, obviously the big one is WannaCry, everybody's heard of that. Um, some of these other ones, uh, top left is Drown, uh, Dirty Cow, which is always funny to say. Um, but, you know, there's uh, obviously um, a lot of, uh, been a lot of vulnerabilities, and this is just from 2016. This doesn't even include like the ones that we've had recently with Experian um, and other, um, other types of vulnerabilities. But um, again, we all kind of, these are obligatory slides here about uh, you know, why, we're, why we're doing the things we do. <clears throat> so we'll move on to security and SDLC. Um, common S, uh, software development lifecycle, and that's, that's kind of a Important point too. We're talking when I say SDLC, I'm meaning software, not necessarily system. So, software development lifecycle. We have requirements, design, development, test, and deployment. Um, where we've been uh, kind of focused um, from a security perspective, and not just with the ASVS, but um, from security uh, in general. Um, you know, during the requirements phases, uh, we attempt to try to map security controls to our requirement or create uh, requirements out of security controls. During the design phase, you can inject some threat modeling, some secure design reviews. Again, our team kind of um, ha has been involved in these, uh, in these types of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, meetings. Um, during the development stage, uh, you have st static analysis and code reviews. Um, there's a lot of people here talking about static analysis. It comes up frequently in a lot of the talks. Um, during the testing phase, you have security test cases, maybe you have abuse uh, case um, type of test, um, and then dynamic analysis as well. And then during the deployment stage, you have a final security review, you do some application security monitoring, maybe that also includes um, vulnerability monitoring on some of the technology stack that you have. Um, you wanna make sure that you're getting information on the vulnerabilities that are coming out, you can deploy patches, things like that. Where we've been focused with the ASVS has really been in the mapping of security controls and the security test cases, and that's where we're going to focus the rest of this presentation. So you'll hear me say the word requirement. You may also hear me say the word control. Um, so what we've done internally at Cerner is that we've, um, we've, we've started using the word control. Requirement means something. Um, and some of, the, some of the verification statements from the ASVS um, really um, aren't just functional requirements. When you think of functional requirements, you think of something that you can test, you can write a test plan for. Not everything in the ASVS is something that you could write a test plan for. So we started using the word control, uh, and some of this will become a little bit clearer here uh, in a minute. But um, if you haven't seen this slide, or if you haven't seen this graphic before, um, it's all over Google and different states, but it's basically one of the challenges that we have with writing requirements or controls is really trying to convey what it is that the requirement or control is trying to do. Um, and everybody has a different interpretation of what that requirement is or what it should do. Um, and not just from a development perspective, but all the people that are involved with writing or viewing or testing a, a control or requirement, everybody has a different perspective on it. And we run into a lot of challenges with that. When we look at the ASPS uh, verification statements, and we get in a room of people, some are developers, some are from, you know, just developers, some are security architects, some of them are solution designers or, um, or solution owners, or, you know, it's, it kind of runs the, the gamut of, of the people that are involved with these. Um, everybody has a different take on what that statement means to them, which is a good thing because it allows us to kind of bring together people from different areas to really get their opinion on what they feel uh, the, the control means. Testing. Um, so obviously, uh, <clears throat> one of the key challenges with security testing is that we can't always expect a test analyst to know um, how to properly test the control. So uh, what I mean by that is um, we can say, um, from, from a security perspective, we can say, something like make sure that uh, your cookies are set for HTTP only. Test analysts are not, they're not security people. They're not always technical enough to know 
that how to check whether a cookie is, is you know, HTTP only enabled. Um, so part of one of our other challenges with this project has been um, that we want to be able to write uh, guidance. Uh, we started to talk about writing test plans originally, but we want to provide guidance to our test analysts to say, here are some common security, um, you know, some common security things that uh, you, uh, you can look for. Um, here's what you should be looking for or how you can do it, um, as opposed to being prescriptive about, like, here's, here's how the test plan is written. So how many here know what the ASBS is? So I apologize, that, okay. So I apologize, I should have uh, stated that ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna read directly from OWASP. The ASBS is a community effort to establish a framework of security requirements and controls that focus on normalizing the functional and non-functional security controls required when designing, developing, testing modern web applications. That's kind of a, a mouthful there, but um, what we have found with the ASVS is that it's, you know, the, the simplistic view of it is that it's a set of uh, verification statements, right? It's a way to verify uh, that a system is, is behaving the way that you, um, from a security perspective, that you intend it to be, uh, be behaving. Um, so it's a good way of testing security from the, from the end, you know, uh, once the software is developed and deployed, it's a good way of testing to make sure that it's uh, in a, in doing it in a secure fashion. One of the key points of the ASBS is that it's a common framework. Um, it's something that, from a Cerner perspective, um, we've been doing security for a very long time. A lot of, a lot of us have been doing security for, for a long time. One of the things is, is that we have a lot of different applications. Some of those applications may be doing, may be doing the same thing as security, just not, not defined the same way. And I think that's what we were looking for with the ASVS is that we wanted to have, um, we wanted to have a common requirement across all of our applications to ensure everybody's doing it the right way. So for those that are familiar with the ASVS, you, you know the concept of, of levels. Um, within the ASVS, there's, there's three. It actually has, starts at zero, um, but the, the three levels um, are actually one, two, and three. Um, for for one, um, we think of this as uh, for any application. So any application uh, period would be, uh, would uh, try to attain level one. Um, for any application that has um, some level of sensitive data, um, then we would say that they need to achieve a level two. For those that are mission critical and have a high uh, concentration of, of things like PHI, PII, PCI, uh, if they're a medical device, um, things like that would be, uh, would be an application that would try to attain level three. So you can think of level three as, obviously, as that's the most, uh, needs to be the most secure application. So again, uh, the, the ASVS is broken up into 16 domains. Um, we are using uh, version three. Um, so in version three, you'll see uh, there are actually a couple uh, domains that were, were taken out. Um, so there's a total of, of, total of 16 domains. Um, and you can see, for those that aren't familiar, that where, they, um, where the different domains fall in. Uh, fall in. So they, you know, anything from architecture, authentication, session management, configuration. Uh, there's also a mobile section, um, just to kind of give you a sense of what's covered in the ASVS. Sorry, I was losing my notes there. <clears throat> so here's just kind of an example of some of the verification statements directly from the ASPS. Um, you see a couple here from you know domain one, two, three, five, and seven. Um, all I wanted to do with this slide is just kind of give everybody a sense for those that aren't familiar of what you know what the verification statements look like, and the levels to the right are how they're applied. Uh, which level that those uh, verification statements apply. So, in other words, um, you'll see 7.8 at the bottom. Uh, that only applies for the most secure, uh, for applications that want to be the most secure. Um, for 5.5 and, you know, 3.7 and 2.18, they all apply to uh, all levels. So, that, just to kind of give you a sense for how, 
uh, the, the, the statements are, are what they look like and how they apply to the different um, levels. All right, so now onto the fun stuff. So as I mentioned, you know, we use the term control as opposed to requirement. Um, just wanted to, because from here on out, I'm going to attempt to use the word control. We, we, I joked before to, that we were going to have a little, you know, a little bucket where you drop a quarter and every time you say the, you know, say the word that you're not supposed to say. Um, we never did that. But um, so what we actually did was um, my team, uh, some of the, uh, some members from the testing community, some members from our solution design, which is kind of like, um, that's our you know, application uh, design level uh, groups, um, and some people from our process groups. We all got together, and what we've been doing is, uh, we, or actually what we did was we took um, the ASBS statement and we turned that into an actual control. So uh, what we, how we interpreted it was that the, the statement was, again, something that you would use to test whether the application was doing that. That's not actually a requirement. So what we did was go through here uh, and start um, taking a look at each one and actually writing a requirement that we can give to development. So for the first one, verify that the application components are identified and known to be needed. What we actually wrote out as something that we would then push out to our development community uh, is that a list of internally developed components such as libraries and modules shall be created. So really, uh, you know, the joke for those that may have written requirements has always been, it's just a sentence with the word shall in it, which, you know, it's kind of um, a shorthand way of, of, you know, writing requirement. Not always true in every case, but um, that's kind of the way we've been looking at these, um, these verification statements. You know, see, like with 316, what we actually did was take that and break it into two. Um, because we felt that there was enough content in, in the verification statement that it would, act, it would be two different types of, of controls. Another thing that we did was uh, create what we call security control, security control types. Um, the easy one is functional, and I apologize for a small font there. Um, the easy one was uh, functional, which is it's basically, it's something that I can write a test plan for. Uh, a, a, a uh, example of a se uh, functional security control is that a logout link shall be accessible in the main page of a domain when a user is logged in. You can write a test plan for that. You can tell the tester, go to the main page, make sure that you see a logout button in the top, you know, top right corner. So that's something simple uh, as far as a, uh, a control that can be tested. The other type that we had was process. Um, it's a list of internal, um, so a process one is something that requires some kind of an input and an output artifact. Um, so for process, uh, one of the examples would be a list of internally developed components such as libraries and modules shall be created. Um, what you would have as the output artifact for that is the list of components. Um, so for those, again, you can't really write a functional test for that, so we, we determined that that fit more into a process type of con uh, control. The third type was DevOps. So these, these types of controls were ones where um, it would require some kind of operational support. The easy one is HTTPS. An application needs to be able to support HTTPS, but at the same time, your operational team needs to be able to in, uh, turn on HTTPS on the host that that application is running on. Or the network team needs to make sure that they're capable of handling HTTPS. So, some, so for these types of controls, uh, one of the examples is uh, time sources on a server shall be synchronized with the current local time correctly. That's a DevOps type of control. The last one um, is kind of, I hate to say it, but it, it's, it has been kind of a catch-all. So for, uh, these are tech, what we call tech design controls. So tech design controls are ones that we could write a test plan for, um, or we may have the ability to write a test plan for, but at the same time, um, like something like an injection, um, you know, you're trying to protect against injection. If you have an application with 100 text boxes on, its main page, um, it's going to be difficult to write a test plan and tell the tester to go through and test each one of those to make sure that it's not susceptible to SQL injection. Um, so what we decided was that for tech design, um, as a separate control, we're going to, they're more related to the architecture ones, and what we're going to ask for is, you know, documentation saying, all right, how is this, co how is this control being implemented? Can you point to some code review 
uh, or even your code repository to show where it's being implemented. Um, so an example would be the component shall implement a tiered architecture model which separates data, controller, and display. There's no way that you can write a test plan for that. A tester's not going to be able to test that. So um, again, that, one of the, that would fall into a category of test, uh, tech design where we would ask the architect to you know, describe how, how their application fits into this uh, and then the point, you know, link out to some code review or some kind of code repository that shows how it's being implemented. So one of the things um, that we did uh, as far as rolling this out to our development community, um, we actually leveraged uh, Google's VSAC. So for anybody that's not familiar with that, it's a, it's a vendor security assessment questionnaire. It's a, um, it's a dynamic interactive uh, questionnaire um, that they actually give to their vendors that are trying to you know, be partner with, uh, with Google. Um, it's open source, uh, it's freely available. Uh, what we actually did was we, we took it, um, we repurposed it um, for, our, for uh, the purpose of the ASVS. Um, and what, we, um, what we've done, uh, and actually I'll get into this here in, in a second. What we've done is we've used the questionnaire to uh, determine what ASVS level uh, that application needs to be. Uh, so we ask a couple questions like, do you contain PHI? Are you mission critical? If the system goes down, is somebody going to die? Um, do you host things like cat videos? Because if that's the case, then you're level one. Um, but we asked some upfront questions to figure out what level uh, of the ASVS that application should be. From there, you know, behind the scenes, uh, once you're at level one or two or three, or once we've made that determination, that's my boss, by the way. So <laughs> it must be important. Apologies. Um, <laughs> What do they say about demos? Nothing ever. Uh... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you ping him and tell him this? <laughs> okay, so, um, so what we've done with the questionnaire is, you know, we've asked a lot of questions up front um, to say, you know, hey, what level are you? Um, and then uh, behind the scenes, <clears throat> what we're actually doing is taking the list of controls that are applied to that level. So if you're a level two, We've taken that subset of controls from the ASVS for level two, and we've taken, you know, that's the, those are the controls that that application would get. What we further did was, uh, we, you know, going through the list of, of verification statements, we understand that not every uh, control in the verification statement would apply to, it, to an application. For instance, if I don't run my own authentication, if that's being offloaded to somebody else, I don't need to respond, I don't need to take on the controls that, are, that apply to authentication or perhaps I don't have a native mobile app, so I don't need to take on the domain that's related to the mobile application. So we've asked a uh, further subset of questions to filter out some of the controls that, um, that don't apply to that, uh, to that application's uh, uh, architecture. So just a pictorial representation here of what I just mentioned, is that we would ask a question, you know, we would ask some questions that would filter out, like what security level are you? Okay, the way they responded, they're level two, they get 130 of the controls. Uh, from there, you know, we ask questions about, you know, what, um, which of the level two requirements apply. So again, do you have a native mobile application? Do you do, you do your own authentication? Um, do you store passwords? Things like that. Once they answer those questions, um, they'll come out with a final list and perhaps that's only like 80 of the controls that they need to take. All right, so um, what we've done um, is once they've answered those questions and once we've made the determination of which of the controls that they need, that they need to take on, um, what we'll do is uh, we will open up um, tasks on their defect tracking tool. Uh, in our case, we use JIRA. Um, so um, the kind of the drawing there that you see at the bottom there is that you know, we take the requirements, they go, we've actually named uh, the dynamic questionnaire the SAVE. I can't tell you what it stands for anymore. Um, but um, once that, you know, the requirements are, um, you know, the, the SAVE is where the requirements uh, are generated. Once the, once the team goes through the SAVE questionnaire uh, and hits submit, 
uh, JIRAs are opened up on their project queue. And from there, we're able to generate reports um, on what's been completed, what's being NA'd, you know, not applicable, um, what's dragging on for too long, is, is there a lot of questions about stuff. Um, we're able to um, generate those reports and supply them up the uh, executive chain. Um, and then more importantly, we can, we can verify that the controls are actually being, um, that the controls are actually being uh, completed. Um, Um, so it depends. So, um, so the save, you know, the the question, the in, uh, the interactive questionnaire. That's what they would go through to ask them questions. Like, you know, I, and I probably should have thrown this in here to, to show an example of what's what's actually listed on there. But the questionnaire will ask things like, you know, like I said, if you if do you have PHI or you mission critical things like that, and then it determines your level, and then from there it's going to say, do you have mobile app, native mobile application? Do you do your own authentication, do you, uh, how do you get your HTTPS certificates? Um, and then, you know, out of that, um, they'll, they'll actually, the user will actually see the list of controls that would be opened uh, on their JIRA uh, queue um, before they hit submit. Once they hit submit, they all get opened up, you know, as individual tasks on their JIRA queue. And from there, you know, they would have to do the analysis to say, this one doesn't apply, this one does, this one's already completed. And, and actually, that's, that's actually a good point. Um, it sounds like a lot, um, you know, if you're opening up 100 JIRAs on somebody's development queue, their, their head's gonna explode, right? Um, the expectation is, is not that all of these are net new things, right? So specifically like the logout button, um, most applications are already gonna have that. So and for them, it's just a check in the box. Um, you know, are they using HTTPS? Yes, they're checking the box. So. So there is some upfront analysis once those JIRAs are open that somebody has to go through and, and you know, uh, confirm that they're either doing it or they're not doing it, um, or that they need to, you know, uh, dig up the information and supply that and all that stuff. But did that answer your question? I apologize. But. Yeah, so, but that would, once they respond to those, uh, that will, that'll make the determination of which controls they would get. So once those, once they've responded to the questions, uh, that'll filter out the list of actual controls that they would get, and those would get opened up as tests on their on their defect tracking. It doesn't have to be Jira; it could be anything, uh, but it would be it would be opened up on their defect tracking, uh, and from there they have to manage the, the controls. That's just what we use internally. So. <coughs> so I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up too because. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of a big proponent of is that I, I don't like to separate the difference between the defect and the security vulnerability. Right? I mean, they're, they're, you can make the argument that a defect is a security vulnerability, right? Because if it's properly exploited, you're making the system misbehave. Um, so to us, you know, one of the things was that we wanted to make sure um, that we're using the same tracking system, you know, that it's something that it's, we're not creating something new. Um, a lot of what we're doing here um, follows, you know, a uh, pretty standard process, you know, and that's what we wanted to do is to, to kind of make sure that we're not, the last thing development teams want is more work, you know, or, or more tools to, to try to manage and go through. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, you know, we kind of stayed within the process that we already have. So does that help? All right, so some of the benefits. Um, so, you know, vulnerabilities suck. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's not only just all the things that we've seen in the news and all the different, um, you know, problems uh, that we see within our companies, but not within other companies. Um, and, um, you know, again, just not separating the difference between vulnerabilities and defects. Um, you know, these things are, nobody's gonna, you know, these things are, are difficult for us to uh, deal with in our industry. Um, but you know, one of the benefits with doing um, doing the ASVS is that we have this adoption, or we have this consistent set uh, of security controls. Uh, it's something that um, we know that solution A is doing this because they're you know they're going through this process. Solution B is doing they're going through the process. They've got the same requirement, the same security requirement. 
Um, and that, that makes it a lot easier for us to do tracking and making sure that you know, our solutions are, are uh, uh, meeting a security standard. <clears throat> um, being able to provide reporting uh, at the same, you know, kind of the same uh, uh, concept here. I mean, being able to provide reporting about where our solutions are from a security standpoint. Um, you know, if we know that solution A is struggling uh, compared to solution B, maybe, maybe the executives uh, need to make a, a change. Um, you know, or, or provide more resources, maybe uh, apply some uh, pressure on that team uh, to make sure that they're, you know, catching up to the other teams. So it's a good way for us to kind of get a, a, a visual, uh, at least at our company, uh, across the board to, to match everybody against, you know, a common framework. I think uh, one of the other things, too, is, is being able to, something I didn't really touch on here, but one of the things, too, is being able to provide um, some guidance uh, from, you know, to our development teams on, on how to prioritize, you know, uh, some of the issues. So um, maybe adding, um, you know, perhaps doing uh, something like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, a, not, a, not a, a, a non-essential, I don't want to say non-essential, but something like, you know, enabling HTTPS should take priority over something that's not, you know, is a little less critical. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a good way for us to, once you have that comp common framework, it's a good way for us to say, hey, these are the 15 that we need to focus on this, this year and make sure everybody's doing it. Um, it's easier for us to do that if everybody's kind of reading from the same book. And, and the last thing, of course, is raising security awareness. Um, you know, again, I, I think we all know this in the security industry. Um, you know, we're, we've, you know, done our training, we've been involved, we've, you know, we come to these conferences, um, but if you're in a if you're in a, a company of thousands or tens of thousands of de developers, they're not all coming to these conferences. They're not all getting that training. Um, so I think you know <clears throat> we obviously can't be the ones uh, saving the world from a security perspective. Um, doing something like this puts security in front of the developers, makes it more prominent, um, helps them kind of make it more tangible to them, you know, in, in the form of a written control <clears throat> or, or a requirement to say, oh, so this is how, you know, this is how security is supposed to look. Um, it puts it more into in the terms that developers are, you know, accustomed to seeing as a requirement. So with that, I don't have anything else. If anybody wants to ask any questions, I'm available. If not, you can always catch up with me afterwards. So. Yeah, we can line up at the microphone right here or just put your hand up and we can come around and bring a mic to you. Hi. Uh, so uh, on the slide where you talked about the uh, Google questionnaire for the vendors, and then you talked about putting things in Jira. So um, I, like, are you saying that like there are some action items given by Jira to your developers for um, an issue that is found in, with a vendor? What? Our questionnaire is internally developed. It's internally hosted. So we, we direct our development teams to that, to that questionnaire. When they fill it out, we call Jira APIs to open up those, you know, those controls on, on, their, <clears throat> on their Jira project. But all that is internal. You know, it's all internally developed and designed. Does that help? Uh, thanks for that. Um, I just had a question around at what point in the uh, process do the developers um, go through the questionnaire? So is it during feature planning or um, sprint planning? I'm just wondering if you this can is, elaborate. Um, I, I know I, I'm probably going <clears> to <throat> trample on what I said earlier, but um, I mean, th this is kind of a, a, a new thing for, d for our solutions, uh, uh, for our applications. So, um, so they, we're actually rolling this out um, to the development organization saying, hey, the, the responsible parties for this, for this application need to go fill this out. So it's, we're, not, we're not doing this um, at any particular stage. It's more of a project that we're rolling out. Uh, you know, we're, we're taking that kind of a view. Um, so when, um, 
when a application owner comes and does the, the questionnaire and they get their you know they get their jurors opened up, it's then up to them to first knock out all the ones that they know they're already doing and then start slotting the ones that they're not. So it's more of a put these on the backlog, take the critical ones, get them slotted first, and then the other ones are, you know, they're lower priority, they can slot, you know, further on down in their in their process. But again, it's not um, <clears throat> it's not something that we're doing in any particular phase um, be because of the size, you know, of these security requirements that, again, if you're a level three application, um, you're gonna get a lot of security controls. Uh, you're probably, I, I think our final number was 200. 214, 240. So by the time we took the ASBS verification statements and rewrote those as security controls, we had a total of 240. So if you're a level three application, you're gonna get 240 JIRAs opened up on your queue, potentially, that's a lot of work, right? So, um, so we're looking more of this as a rollout project as opposed to some particular stage in the SDLC. Does, does that help? Yeah, thank you. And as you, as you work to, to define the controls, um, how typically short do you like to keep them, I guess, so that, that it's understandable for everyone that, that may have to, you know, try to read them and digest them and, and understand what, what, so, what, what's involved? Yeah, that, that's, that's been a pretty good struggle, too, for us. Um, and I think part of, part of what has helped us is that we've had a, a broad range of people that have been involved with it. So it's not just the, it's not just the development people, it's not just the security people. Um, but we've also included testers and designers and things like that because um, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the security people can read some of these controls and say, yeah, I got it. I understand what that means. Um, but, you know, a, a test analyst or a solution designer is going to look at it and say, I have no clue what that is. So we've been wanting to kind of get that input so that we can write the control in such a way that it can be interpreted by different, you know, different, or, uh, different parts of the organization. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we're including is a lot of documentation, a lot of um, guidance. You know, this is what this means. This is what you know. Our, our glossary, uh, the ways, uh, the ways that uh, we're um, trying to provide testing guidance as well. You know, for our testers. So there's there's a lot of uh, accompanying documentation that I think we're going to be relying on heavily. But we're kind of viewing this as a you know, it's going to be an ongoing process. Uh, Satish and I were talking last night. I mean, it's going to take us. Um, you know, we're, we're we're going to be involved with this for years as we kind of build out all the all the information and provide guidance for everybody. So, I hope I hope that helps. 